welcome to another episode of Keeping It Green at the City of Laurel Community Garden. My name is Dawn Williams and I am your host and one of the PG County Master Gardeners. I am also the president of the City of Laurel Community Garden. Today's episode will include a special introductory session on making beer from hops grown in the garden. If you remember the last episode, Brian was here telling us how easy it was to grow hops in your garden, in your own backyard. Well, today he's back to tell us exactly what we can do with the hops and how we can use those as a primary ingredient in making beer at home. We will also visit Tumbleweed, our kids' plot, where Susanna will talk about saving seeds and harvesting some of the vegetables in our garden. And Lisa's back with us today with a tip on how to use Epsom salt in your garden. We also have Shirley who's here to give us tips on composting. So I am so excited to get started today. Let's not waste any time. It's a good day to be in the garden. Thanks Don. I'm Susanna Pieslack and I'm here in the kids uh, plot. Today we're going to do some harvesting um, because it's you know getting to be late summer and that's the best thing to do. And I have two friends helping me right now, Ariana and Molly. So here, sometimes you might see, wow, there's a lot of different things going on. And with some of the different varieties, um, these are cherry tomatoes, but this is a special variety that they're ripe when they're yellow. So Ariana, if you want, you can go on that side and pick some of the yellow cherry tomatoes there. Yeah, they look pretty good. And, well, and you can eat them right away if you want, or organic. Um, and then if you want to, um, once we pick some of these, we also have some little green peppers here. So sometimes you have to look at them and say, all right, well, do I want to let them keep growing or should I pick them this size? And since it's the kids' plot, we can pick them whenever, you know, whenever the kids would like. Um, you can pick it. So I would pick that one. Maybe these little baby ones will let grow for another week or so, a week or two. Um, Mama. But there's, there's two more here if you'd like, Ariana. And and if you do end up picking some green tomatoes, um, you know, by accident, or they even fall on the ground, you can put them in a brown paper bag and with an apple or something else, even just the brown paper bag alone, and fold the top over, and they will eventually ripen. Um, often at the end of the growing season, you'll end up with a lot of green tomatoes, and you can either Google recipes to use them with, or you can wait and have them ripen yeah. in the paper bag. You found some more. Okay, you gonna put any in your bag or just eat them? <laughs> You're gonna put a lot in your bag? Okay. Oh, what about the big ones in there? You can go in there. You can reach in there and pick those big ones. Okay. It's okay. And so because we have a lot of tomatoes in a, in a smaller area, um, sometimes what happens too is we have seeds that the birds will come and drop outside. So we have a couple tomato plants that just grew in our pathway here and we're just gonna let it keep growing. And who knows, maybe, you know, before yeah, we get our first frost, we'll uh, have, you know, some tomatoes coming on this, this plant that the birds helped us plant. Um, and the same thing with cherry tomatoes, as they fall on the ground, they will continue to, to germinate and possibly even next year, we'll have a bunch of little miniature tomato plants popping up in this bed. Um, and in a moment, we're going to have some other helpers in the community, um, in the kids plot, help us pick a few other things. So we'll be right back. So I have some additional helpers in our kids plot today. We have Naila, we have Ben, and we have Jonathan. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some seed saving. So at the end of summer, um, something you can do to make sure you can plant some marigolds next year is save the seeds. It's really easy. It's one of the easiest plants to do. So, if you look, some of these are still blooming. Um, you have buds and then you have flowers still on there. These we're probably not going to be able to save the seeds from right now. But some of these other ones that are getting really dried out, these work well for saving the seeds. So, we can pluck them off. Okay, this one still, it's not completely dry. Um, you can slice it open and see these in here. If you want to put your hand out, I can dump these seeds in your hand and you can, you can pull them out. These are all the seeds, okay? And then we'll put them in our little envelopes or you could do a brown bag. 
Can I have an envelope? Yep. Okay, I'll hold the envelope open and you guys can put the seeds in. Would you like to pick some of these off too? Here you go. So you can open this one up and put it in. This is something I used to do with my mom when I was a kid. When you can save, and you will have so many marigold plants next year. You can put all these in, directly in the ground. And you might want to, yep, the, that's the seeds. And you might want to write on the front of your envelope, marigold seeds from 2015, because, um, you know, that way if you put them with the rest of your seeds in a, in a cool, dark place, um, Can I do this one, Mom? That one's not quite ready yet. See? Oh, there's more over here. Okay. Yeah. So you can, you want to, oh, here, put them in. And you can open this one if you want. See, some of this is just the dead flowers on the top. That part isn't seeds. But if you, once you take the little dead petals off the top and then you open it up with your fingers, there you go. Oh, then you have the flowers. What do marigold seeds do? Yeah. Well, next year, when you're ready to plant, you'll have to have an area with um, a bed, one, maybe one of the kids' plots, and we'll take all the weeds out of it and we'll loosen up the soil, and then you can put, see that part we'll just, you can throw on the ground once you've already taken the seeds out. So next year, when you're ready to plant, you can just take these right from the envelope and sprinkle them around in the soil and cover them with a little bit more and then start watering them every couple days and you'll have a whole bunch more marigold flowers next summer. Oh, that one's good? Okay. How many do we have? I know. We could have marigolds for the whole community garden. Hmm. So some of them, if they're really dried out, they might have a little bit of rot already in there. Some of these ones might not be as ideal to save um, since it was dry, you know, pretty far down the stem. But when you can find them just barely um, dried out, that's, you know, that's better. They still have some of the dead blossom on there and the seeds are nice and black. No, you don't want to eat these. These are just seeds for marigolds. Um, but there is something else in this bed here that we can pick. So on the other side, well, there's some peanuts growing just on the other side of these marigolds. So if you guys want to come around, I'll show you. You want to put your seeds in and then we'll look for peanuts? There's not a ton at the moment, but there's a few hiding in there. So Jonathan and Ben, you want to come around and take a look? At some peanuts? Yeah. There's a few hiding in there. So this, these are what peanuts look like when they're growing in the garden and you still want to take them home and boil them or roast them or wash them. Well yeah yeah you want to wash them too but this is the peanut shell so it's kind of it's still moist right can now. You, if, now? you probably don't want to eat it right now but I can crack this one open and see and this one might not have been ready quite to do but there's not much of there they're still very you know wet and this particular one but these are Oh, you found some. There you go. Two. So yeah, you can take oh, those here. home if you want. All right, you want me to hold them? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much for helping in the kids' plot today. Do you want to also go look at some ground cherries or? Yeah. Okay, we can do that too. So we're over here um, and we're right next to our ground cherries. We have about six plants here and it's coming towards the end of the season for these. They're, you know, getting a little spent. But the interesting thing about ground cherries is they're actually a dessert tomato. So um, they have this outer casing here and when they're ripe, um, they'll have a little bit of a dryish look to them. And then when you open them, they're yellow on the inside. And so you, you can get rid of the casing part and then just eat this part. If they're green, it means they're not ripe yet. If they're yellow, then you can just go ahead and eat them. That one looks okay. And they taste a little bit like pineapple. So, um, you know, it's kind of fun for kids. They can pick them and, you know, they probably have the patience to sit and open all of these. Um, but it's just a nice fun variety. 
um, of tomatoes that you can grow in the garden, something a little bit sweet. And do you guys like picking ground cherries? Yeah. All right, well help yourself. There's a whole bunch that have fallen on the ground and as long as they're yellow on the inside and not wrinkly, you're welcome to eat them, okay? So help yourself. Thank you guys in the kids' plot. Thank you guys for helping with the kids' plot. You're welcome. Now over to Brian, who's going to teach us a little bit more about what to do with hops and making beer. In 2013, the president of Laurel Regional Hospital, John Spearman, told the Baltimore Sun something I didn't fully appreciate when I started here was how deeply this community loves this hospital and how strongly it is willing to fight for its success. So why does he think the community would stand idly by now while the hospital is dismantled? You cannot afford to stay silent. Call, write, or email Governor Larry Hogan. Demand the premier health care that your tax dollars have been paying for. Hey, thanks, Susanna. Uh, so I'm Brian. I've been uh, brewing beer for probably about five years now. I've been in Laurel for about five years. And last time we talked, I mentioned we should do an episode on beer. And so uh, talking to Susanna, we thought she'd, uh, we'd invite you guys over to our house and we'd try making out some beer. Um, what you see here are all the ingredients and a bunch of my equipment. Um, best thing I like to show uh, from the start, don't feel like you have to have all this to get started. I started with a real simple pot, a real simple crab pot on my kitchen stove. So if you can uh, get a pot that can hold about three gallons of water, you can run a boil on it. Uh, you really only need this and then one of these buckets to be your closed fermenter. Um, that's kind of the basics of it. As I said, I've been doing this for about five years and it's a hobby where every year you get a little bit more equipment. So um, most of what I have here, I've amassed over the last couple of years. So. Um, don't at all feel intimidated that there's a high price tag to get involved and get started. It's a lot of fun and it's really simple to get started. Um, before we do anything, the most important thing with making beer is keeping things clean. You don't want to use bleach. You don't want to use traditional soap. Uh, homebrew shops are going to have uh, sanitizers. There's this, it's called Star San. There's PBW uh, or PWB. There's a lot of different products out there. Um, the intention is you want to get all your surfaces clean that are going to touch your ingredients. Um, the final ingredient that's important in beer that makes your alcohol is yeast. Um, there's yeast in the, in the air, there's bacteria in the air, and once you make this nice pot of sugary liquid, that's what the yeast is going to want to eat, but all these other bugs are going to want to eat it too. So that's where sanitization becomes probably the most important part. If you've ever had beer that maybe it didn't taste right or you've ever made beer that didn't really taste right either, probably a good chance you had some bacteria in there or there was a wild yeast that was uh, battling the other yeast trying to eat all that tasty sugar. So as I mentioned uh, a couple times now, sugar is uh, probably the second most important ingredient. Um, the sugar is going to come from grain. Um, if you've ever made tea or coffee, you've made probably a half beer. You've come pretty close. Um, your four ingredients for beer are going to be water, sugar or grain, hops, and yeast. The water, I just pull straight off the tap. Laurel here has some really great water. Uh, jailbreak up the street uses Laurel water. They, um, one of the articles I read on them, they said they selected Laurel because they've actually got a really good natural water source. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of chemical treatments to get the water right. Your next ingredient is going to be grains. And here's where we've got a couple of different grains. Um, I've got some specialty grains. So what you see here in the bag, this is going to be used for color. So these grains, there's probably less than a pound of grain here. It's not very much. And like these are little four ounce bags. But the recipe I'm making today is a dark lager. And so I'm going to use these grains to really help establish that color. Sometimes the grains add a little bit of flavor, so some of these lighter grains are going to add and contribute a little bit to the flavor, but most of the grains that are in the bags here are going to be used for coloring. These other big bags here, this is called dry malt extract, and really what someone else has done, um, they have gone through the process of harvesting the grain, uh, kilning it, and then converting this into your sugar powder. Uh, you can get it in a liquid form, you can get it in a dry powder form, or eventually if you wanted to get into some advanced brewing, you would do what's called all grain, where you actually wouldn't use these 
and instead you'd have probably 20 pounds of something like this where you're going to use um, your crushed grains, your specialty grains as the entire source of your sugar. Um, I like to do this. I find this uh, makes perfectly good beer. Um, ends up being a little bit more expensive in terms of the ingredient price, but if someone else can do the work and make it a little bit easier for me, I don't mind. Um, so the process is going to go, as we've mentioned, we've made coffee, we've made tea before, kind of the exact same idea. I'm going to dissolve my sugar in water. Now I basically made a sugary water. Just like tea, when you dissolve your, your tea, you're extracting the flavor out of your tea leaves into your uh, steeping water, so now you've got a flavored water. What they found a long time ago when they first started making beers, it was overly sweet. So how do they get some of those balanced characteristics of not overly sweet? Um, they wanted something a bit more balanced, and that's where they started using hops. So today, I'm going to be using hops that I got from uh, Maryland Homebrew. Um, for the recipe I'm making, as I said, it's a dark lager, so I'm actually using a German-style hop. Um, gosh, there are probably 40 or 50 different varieties of hops, and people are trying hybrid strains all the time. So hops are really cool because they're constantly coming up with new varieties, and there's different ways you can use them. Um, that's going to balance out the sweetness that's in the sugar extract, basically the sugar water that you made, and now you've got a balance of bitterness and sweet. So now you have this really rich, sugary, uh, bittersweet water, how do you get beer? How do you get the alcohol? That's where the yeast is going to come in. Um, this is actually a yeast harvest that I did from uh, a previous batch. So the yeast is actually the substance that's all the way down in the bottom, and it's just got a little bit of sugar water to, uh, to feed off of. But this is basically just keeping a live culture of yeast. Um, the process is actually going to be really, really simple. So we've mentioned we've got our water. We're going to bring this up to probably about 150, 160 degrees. Then after that, we're going to add our specialty grains. So I'm going to take these grains, put them into a bag, put them into the water, let it sit for about 20 minutes. When that's done, I'll take out the bag and I'll bring this up to a boil. Once it's up at a boil, I'll add my uh, dry malt extract. So I'll add that uh, powder that's already been uh, extracted for me. And that'll start a boil of about an hour. Based on the recipe, you can add your hops at different times. And normally the recipes are really clear. They'll tell you add your first hops at 60 minutes, add your second hops at 15 minutes remaining. Um, at that point, that'll give you that balance of the longer a hop boils, the, uh, the more bitterness you're going to extract out of it. The less a hop boils, the more um, aromatics and the more flavor characteristics you're going to out of it, you're going to get out of them and a lot less of the bitterness. When that's done, you're going to be at a rolling boil. I'm going to take this inside, put it in my sink, try and bring it down to about 80 degrees. So basically bring this temperature down to uh, close to room temperature, maybe a little bit higher. That's where I'm going to pitch my yeast. Anything higher than that, the uh, high temperature of the water would actually kill the yeast culture on you. Um, anything lower than probably about 60 or so, uh, depending upon the, the style of beer you're making, um, the yeast will just go back dormant. It'll fall back asleep. Um, so kind of in a nutshell, that's it. Um, you're going to start with your water. Uh, you're going to steep your grains, get some nice color in there, bring it to a boil, add your, uh, basically your sugar source, your malt, and let that run boil for about uh, an hour. During that hour, you're going to add your hops. Um, all the recipes are going to tell you the schedule that you want to add the hops in. When that hour is done, you're going to try and cool this down as quickly as you can. And um, when that's done, you're going to transfer it into your fermenter. And these comes in all shapes and sizes. So you've got plastic buckets. Um, you can get uh, glass carboys, um, some really fancy equipment. You have like stainless steel. Uh, conical fermenters. Um, here's where if you want to spend a lot of money, you can get some really high-end equipment, but this will run you $15 up at Maryland Homebrew, and this does a great job too. So I would take this, they'll sell a lid, I would put my finished beer in here, pitch my yeast, uh, give it a good shake, and then 
to seal it up, this hole here is going to be for an airlock. So you can see just like on that um, Gatorade bottle there, I'm going to put that in. There's a reason for this, and this is actually a really important reason. If you don't have a way for air to escape out, when yeast eats sugar, it makes two things, alcohol and carbon dioxide. You've got a sealed container so nothing else can get in, but if you don't let that carbon dioxide out, you're going to build up a lot of pressure. Uh, most people who have home brewed have done this at some point in time, or they've got a friend who's told a story where it, the airlock clogged and they come home one day and so much pressure built up that it blew the lid off and they've got a mess everywhere. So um, definitely an important piece of the fermentation process. As your yeast is making that alcohol, turning that sugar into alcohol, it's also making carbon dioxide. And so if you don't let that carbon dioxide out, you're basically building up a nice big bomb. Not fun to clean. Um, when it's done, you're going to have um, two main substances in here. You're going to have probably about four and a half gallons of your fermented beer. And then you'll probably have about a half gallon of sediment. So as yeast consumes the sugar, produces your carbon dioxide, produces your alcohol, the yeast is going to fall out of suspension and it's going to start to collect at the bottom. Um, so you may actually get about a half gallon of yeast sediment. Normally that's not anything you can do with in the beer. So you want to separate those two. If you've ever had a cloudy beer, um, something that wasn't like nice crystal clear, you know, if you look at this one, for example, this probably doesn't look like anything you'd want to drink. It's kind of cloudy. Um, and you've got your yeast culture at the bottom. When you go to bottle or to put it into a keg, you're going to want to separate these out. Most of this is pretty easy to do. Um, you can get what's called a racking wand, where it's actually going to just pull the liquid out and you just keep that in the liquid until it gets down. Right when you start to see it get a little cloudy, that's when you stop. Um, that's mainly it when it comes out of fermentation. So you would pull your, um, your beer out of the uh, fermenter, leaving the sediment, and you put that into a bottling bucket. So it's going to be another, something, uh, another pail that looks like this. It's going to have a spigot to it, and that's literally it does what it says. You're going to put bottles up to it, and you're going to draw the beer out into the bottle, uh, put an uh, airtight oxygen seal on it, and now you've got bottled beer. Um, to give it that final carbonation in the bottle, you can put in a little bit of extra priming sugar, and so it does a little bit of more, uh, sorry, a little bit more um, sugar consumption inside of the bottle. So the yeast is going to be, still be active and eat a little bit more sugar in the bottle, and that's what's going to give it that final carbonation. Um, if you got into kegging, uh, you wouldn't use priming sugar, you would actually use carbon dioxide and do what's called forced carbonation where you push um, carbon dioxide from a tank directly into the keg and it'll absorb the carbon dioxide in that way. But I'm kind of going a little bit, little bit more advanced on us. Um, so yeah, that actually is a really simple process. I know I've kind of covered a lot, but just to kind of recap and just kind of highlight how simple it is. I've got water, I'm going to bring it up to a nice temperature. I'm not going to boil it yet. I'm going to add my specialty grains to give it some color. If I'm doing a dark beer, here's where I'm going to add grain that gives it that darker color. If I'm doing like an Irish red, there's some grains that give it kind of that reddish color. Once I'm done with my specialty grains, I'm going to bring it up to a boil, add my malt. That's going to give me that sugar source. That's where we basically made our, our tea or our coffee. Um, I don't want it sweet. So I want to balance it out with some bitterness and some flavor. So I'll add my hops. Uh, again, you're going to add them at different times during the schedule based on the recipe you're using. When that hour is up, I'm going to take it and try and cool it off. I'm going to try and cool it down to about 80 degrees, add my yeast, pour it out of my kettle into my fermenter. I'm going to add my yeast at that time and I'm going to seal it up. Let this sit for about two weeks. And then it's time to uh, rack this or pull this out of the fermenter into a bottling bucket. And then from the bottling bucket, I can just hook my bottles up to them, fill them up, put a little bit of that priming sugar in there to give the yeast a little bit more uh, food to eat. 
seal them with a, uh, ox uh, an airtight seal, and probably in about two weeks, you've got a uh, really good beer to drink. Um, all these ingredients here, depending upon the recipe you want to make, can run you anywhere from $20 to $50. So a uh, five-gallon fermenter can make about two cases worth of beer. So that's actually not a bad deal, uh, $20 to $50 for two cases of beer that you made. Um, you get the process of enjoying it, of uh, enjoying making it. And one of the things that really got me into making beer is it's a very social event. So I'll have friends over. Um, we'll have some beer while we're doing it. Um, sometimes I'll have some friends over and we'll get two or three kettles going at once and I'll get different batches going together. But it really becomes just like a nice, fun social experience. And um, you normally learn something new every time you do it. Uh, it rarely comes out exactly perfect, but sometimes you're surprised you make something that you really, really enjoy. Uh, as long as you're keeping notes, you know what you did, you know what you might want to try again the next time. And that's what keeps making it interesting of every time you want to try making something a little bit new. All right, that covers it. Thank you very much. Today's segment, we're going to talk about composting. In particular, we're going to talk about vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is the use of worms in compost. We'll talk about the pros and cons and how it works. worm composting work. Basically, the worms break down organic matter. In this case, they're using the waste from your food. When you throw away your plants and your veggies, put them in a bin, put some worms in, and they will break down your food waste into rich organic matter. It's basically compost and you can use it as a soil amendment. Now, a lot of people think that the worms are breaking down your food waste by eating it, when in fact they're eating microorganisms that are used to break down your food waste. Bottom line, the end result is a rich, nutrient-rich compost. Some people even call it black gold. Now let's talk about the pros and cons of worm composting. The first benefit is that there's virtually no smell when you put your food waste in a compost bin second benefit is that anybody can do it. Whether you live in an apartment in small space or whether you have a bigger house. It doesn't take a lot to do worm composting. The third benefit is that kids love it. Kids generally love worms and this is a great way to get your kids involved in seeing nature in action. There are only two issues that I can think of. One would be is if your compost bin attracts fruit flies or other pests. But there's a way you can minimize or eliminate this altogether if you align and arrange your bin properly. The second con or issue that I can think of is if you have an aversion to worms. I can't help you with that. Only to say that, remember, worms don't bite. And two, think about all the benefits. I think the benefits outweigh the cons. Hopefully by now, I've convinced you to start worm composting. Here's how to get started. You will need four things. First, a bin. It can either be plastic or wood. The second thing you'll need is what's called bedding. Any paper-based material will do that includes newspaper or paper towels. The third thing you'll need are food scraps. Lastly, you'll need worms. You don't need a whole lot to start. Start with a pound and ask for red wigglers. Worm compost. Thank you, Shirley. Um, my tip for the day is Epsom salt. Epsom salt helps improve flower blooming and enhances a plant's green color. It's made of magnesium and sulfur, and most of us have it laying around the house. Um, it actually, it can help your plants become bushier and definitely greener. And um, it allows the plants to better take in uh, valuable nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And what you need is a two gallon container for your water and two tablespoons of Epsom salt. Put it in, you swish it up a little bit and you can then just put it on your plants and you can do this like once a month 
and um, your plants will be greener and a lot healthier and it'll help them absorb all the nutrients that are um, that they need in order to survive. Now to you, Dawn. Thanks, Lisa. I hope you all enjoyed today's show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for spending time with us at the City of Laurel Community Garden. Be sure to tune in to Laurel TV each Saturday at 8 a.m. and Wednesdays at 10.30 a.m. Catch us on Sunday evenings at 1 p.m. Laurel TV is on Comcast Channel 71 and Verizon Channel 12 inside the city limits. If you are outside the city limits, you can watch live streaming on laureltv.org. Or you can find us on YouTube by searching for Laurel TV. Be sure to like our Laurel TV, TV Facebook page and the City of Laurel Community Garden Facebook page. Until next time, keep it green.